Right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about private economic spam protection in Baku with Arlen. Uh, so my name is Mas Oscar. I'm the protocol research lead at VAC, and we research peer-to-peer -peer private and censorship resistant communication. Uh, it has its origin in the status app, um, basically trying to improve the underlying protocols. So we build things like VACU, but also other protocols. So today, uh, we're going to talk about VACU and some of the current problems it has. Then we're going to look into RLN and RLN Relay. And then finally, we'll look into some implementations and future work. So first of all, what is VACU? So it's basically a set of modular protocols for peer-to-peer -peer communication. Uh, and by modular, we basically mean that you can sort of pick and choose the protocols um, and sort of how you use them depending on your specific constraints or trade-offs. So for example, privacy versus bandwidth usage. Uh, it has kind of a focus on privacy, security, and running in resource-restricted environments, such as browsers and mobile phones. And it's kind of this uh, spiritual su successor to Whisper, where originally you had this kind of holy trinity back in the day with Ethereum, Swarm, and Whisper. So looking briefly at sort of uh, protocol interactions in Vacu, um, so you have this kind of gossip domain with the uh, Vacu relay, which is based on libptp gossip sub for peer-to-peer -peer messaging. And then you have this kind of helper utility uh, protocol. So for example, you have filter protocol, uh, which is for bandwidth restricted nodes to just receive a subset of messages they care about. Uh, we have light push for, for sort of nodes with short connection windows to sort of push messages into the network. And then we have a store protocol for uh, basically nodes that want to retrieve historical messages that have been sent to them while they were offline. Uh, this is kind of a subset of, of uh, protocols and uh, if you're interested, you can check out the specs for more. And then we also have how you actually discover these peers and so on, so protocols for that. Um, just briefly kind of an overview of how the network, how you can think of it. Um, so it's kind of this open network where di nodes have different capabilities because you have browser nodes and mobile nodes and servers and clusters and whatnot. Um, and they have different capabilities. And here you see sort of the red uh, dotted line that's kind of this uh, gossip domain, a specific mesh uh, pops up topic and you can have a different mesh that's disconnected or connected depending on topology. And then you have these kind of helper protocols, request supply protocols and so on. Uh, and there's a few problems here. Um, so one big one is, is, is going to be the focus of today. It's kind of spam, because in this sort of open, permissionless uh, gossip network, if anyone can send messages, that means that they can also overwhelm the network, and you can sort of you, you want to have a solution for that, and basically how to deal with that. Uh, there's also other problems in terms of sort of incentivizing these service nodes, because uh, some nodes are going to provide more uh, utility to the network. So for example, storing historical messages. So you want to have some way of sort of uh, dealing with that. Um, yeah, so dealing with network spam, so I mean traditionally if you look at uh, spam and how people deal with that kind of thing, like you have with uh, Google and Facebook and Twitter accounts and so on, you usually have like a phone number verification. Um, and the idea there, right, is that it's kind of expensive to get a phone number. Um, and also, yeah, it's a way of knowing who, who the users are, but it's also like a civil resistance, um, civil resistance mechanism. But it's centralized and it's not private. Uh, in Whisper, originally, there is this uh, proof-of-work algorithm, um, but it doesn't really work for heterogeneous devices, so nodes, because you're never going to be able to generate enough proof-of-work on a mobile phone. It's going to drain your battery, uh, so you have to have the requirement set low enough, which means that someone can just spin up an AWS node and overwhelm the network. Uh, there's also things like peer scoring, which is used to, in LPDP gossip sub, which is sort of the peer-to-peer -peer layer for uh, Ethereum and others, other networks, um, and blockchains and so on. And it, it, it's useful, uh, but it also has some issues it's, to some extent. It can sort of use it for the censorship and as, as sort of civil attacks as well, because you can always spin up multiple nodes and identities and uh, so on. So the idea is basically to use this RLN mechanism uh, for private economic spam protection using CK snarks. And RLN relay is basically the combination of the really peer to peer protocol, basically gossip sub, uh, plus RLN. So what is RLN? Uh, stands for rate limiting nullifier, and basically, it's, uh, it's wait, rate limiting just means that you can send n messages uh, in a given period. Uh, and this is an anonymous rate limiting me mechanism based on CK snarks, and it can be used for things like spam protection in peer-to-peer -peer messaging systems, but also uh, rate limiting in general. So things like decentralized capture. Um, and when we say it's anon anonymous, we basically mean that the message can't be linked to the publisher. Uh, and it's going to be a dedicated presentation to RLN later by Blagor, so I recommend people check it out. Just briefly, history of RLN. Uh, originally, it was sort of this uh, 
blog post by Barry on EFRESearch research a few years ago. Um, and since then, a lot of work has, has sort of happened in terms of various implementations and, and performance improvements and the construct and so on. So looking at sort of how the construct, how it, how it works, there's basically uh, three steps. The first is sort of have some registration process where you register some kind of group. And then you have a signaling uh, thing that happens. So you signal for each message. And then finally, there's sort of the verification and slashing. And, and uh, the registration is basically it's based on some kind of capital at risk. And this can either be economic or, or social capital, like we've seen with Interrep and so on. Uh, and basically, if you double signal, uh, you get slashed. So the registration uses the register with some membership group uh, in order to be able to signal. And this can happen with the central server, or it can happen with, with a smart contract. Uh, and you have this identity commitment, uh, sort of same thing idea with a semaphore here that we heard about earlier, um, which is stored in some Merkle tree. Uh, and basically, you have this identity secret that's generated somehow, which is random for the two byte value, and then you sort of hash it twice to get the identity commitment. Uh, and then basically, you have a Merkle proof to prove membership. And, and the idea is to make it economically or otherwise costly to register to sort of guard against civil attacks. So that can be the financial thing, so E, for example, or social stake, so using interrep, uh, for example, uh, where you can sort of prove that you have a reputable social media account. Uh, for the signaling, so basically registered members, they can signal once for a given period or, or n times in a given period, uh, which is kind of the external nullify slash epoch. And the users can store this membership, membership tree either locally or get it from somewhere. And then you generate this signal proof uh, to prove membership. And then basically you have this, this signal, and, 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 which is, and then you hash it, you take a cache of, of sort of content, actual thing that you want to signal. As a mental model, you can figure it kind of a, a voting booth where you can only vote once. Um, verification and slashing. So basically, uh, the verification is to ensure that the signals proof, as well as some other parameters, are, are correct. So you need to make sure that sort of the external nullifier is in the correct epoch, so you're not sending a message that's in the future or in the past, for example, in the case of time-based epochs. Uh, you want to make sure it's a non-duplicate check, uh, like have a non-duplicate check, so you're not sort of sending the same message twice. Uh, you want to make sure the zero knowledge proof is, is, is checks out, is ver it verifies. And then also, finally, you want to check that it's, um, it's not a double signaling, right? So you, so you don't have a user sending more than uh, one message in a given time period. Uh, and then slashing. So this is based on Shamir's secret sharing, which we'll look into a bit later. Um, and basically, if you use double signals, then you're able to reconstruct the secret key, which enables the person or entity that identifies this to sort of get their stake if there is this one to get. So I'm not going to go into the circuit in detail here, but, but just roughly in terms of the, the inputs and so on for proof generation. So uh, you have this basic identity secret, which is a semaphore identity thing. And then you have path elements and identity path index. And this is just like a standard Merkle proof. Uh, and then you have these public inputs. So epoch here is, is basically the external nullifier. And it's usually like a timestamp or a period, which is the kind of voting booth um, analogy, where you can only signal once during that period. And then you have X, which is kind of the signal hash, so, so the hash of the actual thing you, you say, you're sending. And RLN identifier here is just uh, for a specific RLN app. Uh, and path elements here is just one. This is for simplicity. It indicates the number of neighbors at that level. Uh, circuit output. So this is calculated locally. Um, and here you have this Y, which is a share of a secret equation that we'll look at soon. And then you have this kind of internal nullifier. And the internal nullifier acts as a kind of unique fingerprint uh, for a given app, user, and period combination. And then you also have the root for the, the Merkle tree. So how is this output with this Y and internal nullifier calculated? So this is the kind of uh, Shamir using Shamir's uh, secret sharing, where basically if you have a given identity, uh, uh, A0 here, and this signal twice in, a, in an epoch, then A1 will be the same, right? Because the, the hash of A0 and that external nullifier uh, will be the same. And then for a given RLN app, uh, so kind of that local context, internal nullifier also stays the same because uh, it's the hash of A1 and RLN identifier. Uh, and X is the signal hash. Um, 
which is different, and, and Y is a public output, which means that we can basically reconstruct the identity secret A0. And with this identity secret revealed, then this gives access to the financial stake if it's stored in a smart contract, for example. So some secret sharing, and this can also be generalized, but in this, this simple case, is based on the idea of like sort of splitting a, a, a secret into shares. Uh, and in this case, we have two shares. And since A0 and A1 stays the same uh, for a given user and, and epoch, uh, and we sort of have X changing, and sort of the single hash, right, because the signal is different, we are able to reveal A0, which is the identity secret. And also worth noting that if X is the same, then you don't get any more information, so that's also why we have a separate check for uh, uh, duplicate messages. So the actual output message, so that's what you're actually sending. Um, so you have the signal itself, which is the thing you're trying to communicate. The proof, this internal nullifier, which is kind of this fingerprint thing. Uh, the hash, single hash, and that is why public output we saw before for the Shamir secret sharing stuff. Uh, all end identifier, and then also this uh, root to the Merkle proof, and then uh, the external nullifier or epoch. Uh, in order to sort of detect this, this double signaling, uh, you do need to store some metadata because it's a sequence of messages here. So, so um, and this can happen either at the server or in a peer to peer network. It can happen sort of at each client, at each node. And such it can happen in, in sort of a different, few different ways here. But basically, one idea is sort of how to store this metadata is you store it per external nullifier, so per epoch. And then you have this kind of internal nullifier, which is this fingerprint. And then you have these X and Y shares. And with that, uh, you can sort of, first of all, detect double signaling. So you know when to try to reconstruct a secret. And then you can reconstruct the secret and, and get the stake. So the verification checks. Um, you need to check sort of that external nullifier uh, such period is sort of the correct one. And for example, this can be like a 20 second window. So you take the, maybe the Unix epoch time and, and then you divide it up into windows. Uh, you want to discard um, duplicate messages. Um, verify the zero knowledge proof, otherwise you discard a message. Uh, and then check if there's more than one X, Y share combination per external nullifier and internal nullifier. And if there is, then we reconstruct A0 and sort of, yeah, get the stake. And then finally, you sort of want to store this, this metadata for the next incoming message. So how does this work together with the relay protocol? So basically, you have this contract that's on chain. Uh, you have a publishing peer that sort of registers to some group, and they lock up some funds. Um, and then when a spammer, they, they try to sort of publish more than one message within a given epoch, then it will sort of relay this to, to sort of its other peers. And, and that routing peer can sort of identify this message as, as spam and sort of not relay it. Uh, and it can also sort of go to the, the contract and take their, their stake and sort of delete them or disable them or what have you. It's sort of worth noting here that this can be combined with traditional techniques like peer scoring. Uh, because for example, if maybe a spammer is sending like an invalid CK proof or they're sending a, a duplicate message or something like that. So that doesn't allow necessarily the node to take the financial stake, but you can still punish them in some way with the sort of by augmenting it with peer scoring. So uh, registration, you have these nodes. Uh, and, and basically, you have to listen to the membership contract uh, because you need to keep your own sort of, you have to keep track of the Merkle tree yourself uh, there. Uh, and then you sort of generate this uh, secret key, public key thing, and you register it uh, through contract. And then that contract gets updated, sort of inserting that into a list or a tree. And then you wait sort of for the block containing that insertion to be, to be mined. Uh, and then events are emitted to all these nodes, and they can sort of update their state. For routing, I don't know if you can see here, it's a bit, but basically you have your publishing node and all these other type of nodes, and each node they need to keep track of this metadata we talked about earlier, so kind of a nullifier map, uh, so they can sort of detect if double signal is happening and so on. And they also need to have keep track of an epoch, so this can be like a not like a real time clock, but like soft, roughly in sync with some real time. Um, and then when you're publishing, you construct this message and like add the epoch and the, all the nullifiers and CK proof and so on, and, and have that in a bundle that you then forward. To, to your next node, and then it does all its check, right? So it checks that uh, the epoch is, is sort of uh, not too far away in the future or in the past. Uh, you check that the secret proof verifies, um, and you check that it's not a duplicate message and so on, and not the double signaling. 
And if all of those things pass, uh, then you forward a message. Um, yes, yeah, so just briefly on various implementations. So we first started looking into this uh, a while ago, and, and back then, this was just like basically a circum based implementation, which was very slow. It was basically only JavaScript, and proof time was like almost a minute. Um, and then there was also this Bellman based native Rust implementation by Owner, which is the one that's currently used in, in Nimbaku. Uh, but since then, like a lot of work has been done on, on Circum itself and other performance implementations with, uh, with Wasm and whatnot. So now the proof time is like under a second. Uh, but basically, now we have these two different implementations, um, which is not ideal from like a reuse, compatibility, audit, and, and so on point of view. And also, uh, the current spec is right now Circum based. And it's like a lot more performant now with Wasm and Circum2 and all of these things. So one thing we are sort of starting to do is this library called Circuit, uh, Circuit which is basically using Circum and Rust with Arc Circum. Uh, and the goal is basically to get the best of, of both worlds here, because on the one hand, you have sort of the Circum, Solidity, JavaScript, ecosystem shelling point, where you get all these nice like Solidity verifiers and whatnot. But on the other hand, you also have the Rust sort of CK ecosystem with all the cool stuff. And as context here, one thing that's different here from maybe other applied CK stuff uh, is that Baku is like this peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure thing, right, that's running in lots of different environments. And there's implementations in NIM, in JavaScript, in Go, and also some are sort of working on a Rust implementation. There's a slightly different kind of domain there. And, and the goal is basically to enable people to leverage these circum-based constructs from non-JavaScript environments. And it's using these circum circuits via Arc Circum, some Rust for scaffolding, and then basically expose a, a C API. Uh, and this also gives access to sort of other parts of the Rust CK system uh, with Arcworks, uh, but also opens the door to other constructs like Halo 2 and whatnot. And we also help sort of add Circum 2 support to, to Arc Circum for this. Some future work. Uh, so currently, basically, we have this uh, Nimbaku testnet, which is like this peer to peer toy chat app. Uh, and I don't have a demo, but there is a demo. There's a, there's a tutorial for how to run a demo, if you're interested. Uh, basically, the work of progress as well to make this group management more dynamic and do some smart contract interaction around that and so on. And then we want to migrate to use ZeroKit for this sort of multi-client testnet. So the idea is that you have these nodes in, in, in NIM that can sort of verify the proofs and really message and so on. But then you, as a client or DAP, you would sort of use the VACU.js, for example. And so some, some performance work around RLN. Uh, when it comes to sort of Merkle tree computation, storage overhead, efficient uh, membership operation, and so on, as well as some smart contract tweaks and, and, and things there. Uh, we also want to start looking into sort of using RLN and Interrep for kind of a zero cost decentralized capture. That's slightly a different kind of use case, but it's very much related here. Uh, and then also, finally, like if you remember this sort of vacuum net network picture I showed earlier, this is kind of RLN really as a start here because we also need kind of these credentials and, and peer reputation to basically have this, this modular network where you can have uh, privacy guarantees for like a sustainable uh, network and so on. Uh, here's some links, there's a spec. Uh, Blago is here, uh, did a great job with that. Uh, we have the Relay spec, uh, testnet tutorial for, for Nimbaku. Uh, write up on RLN Relay, uh, this um, CK kit, um, JavaScript sort of Circum uh, code, which is useful. Uh, the Bellman based implementation by owner. And then Circuit, which is this sort of thing we're starting to do with using Circum with Arc Circum for Vacu P2P. Um, and we also have a paper on this construct and so on coming out in July, I think. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Any questions? We can take two questions. Uh, anyone? Uh, yeah, good. Thanks, Brian. Has anyone uh, like prototyped a chat application that uses Waku? Or uh, like, how far would the lift be to do that from where you are currently? Sure. Uh, so basically, Status is using uh, Waku in production. It's in the process of kind of, because this is a Waku version 1, and they're kind of in the process of moving over to Waku v2. Um, uh, then there's also other people using Vacuum, not, not necessarily for human chat, because this doesn't necessarily have to be used for human chat. So I think it's a project called Railgun that are starting to look into using RLN with Vacu, Vacu JS and so on. And we have other products like Wallet Connect, for example, those using Vacu. So it's not just for, for human chat kind of thing. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so there's a bunch, but it's kind of still very early stage, especially with this RLN thing, because to actually make it useful, we need to 
bridge the gap between the sort of JavaScript and name implementation, but yeah. Cool. Yeah. One more question. Barry? Uh, just more of a comment on the last question. Um, Blagoy and, and Nazi have implemented that. Yes. Blagoy is here uh, for ZK chat, and so it's like ORLN based web browser chat. All right, thanks, Oscar. <laughs>